Thank you. Um, so as Amy's mentioned, I'm Anna, I'm a physio by background and today's event is focused on my PhD project which involved developing a new website called the Virtual Knee School to provide information and an exercise plan. The first thing I wanted to do is just say thanks very much to um, Amy and the BRC for the opportunity to share my research today um, and also a special thanks to Barbara and Ruby um, who are kind of um, going to be sharing some of their views during the presentation. And our aim with the presentation is to provide an overview of the Virtual Knee School project. And we hope that this will give you an insight into a range of different areas, including knee replacement, um, how research can be used to develop digital tools, um, and also how patient and public involvement is really important to the research process. So the plan for the presentation is that first of all, I'm going to give a bit of background to the project and outline its aim. I'm then going to discuss patient and public involvement in the project alongside uh, Ruby and Barbara. Um, and just and patient and public involvement. This is really referring to um, patients, carers and other members of the public being actively involved in helping with various parts of the research process. So this can include things um, like helping to review documents, helping decide what to include in the website, etc. So it's a bit different to actually taking part in the research as a research participant. So after we've given an overview of the patient and public involvement, we'll move on to summarising the project and then discussing each separate phase in turn. I'm then going to summarise the overall conclusions from the project and then we'll talk a little bit about what we're thinking in terms of possible next steps now we've finished the project. And then, as Amy said, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. So the first thing we're going to do in terms of thinking about the background of the project is watch a video from the Virtual Knee School. And this explains a little bit about what happens during knee replacement surgery. So I'm just going to share that um, video now. I think we've got it up here. Hopefully that will all work okay. And I'll play that video now. In a healthy knee, the ends of the bones are covered with a protective material called cartilage. The cartilage provides a smooth surface so that the bones move easily on each other. If the cartilage and other parts of the knee are damaged, it can cause a lot of pain. To help with the pain, total knee replacement surgery may be carried out. This involves replacing the damaged knee joints with an artificial one. During total knee replacement surgery, the surgeon makes a cut in the skin over the knee. The surgeon then removes the damaged ends of the thigh bone and shin bone and replaces them with smooth artificial materials. Different materials may be used, but usually the ends of the bones are replaced with metal and a plastic tray is put between them. Sometimes the surgeon also replaces the back of the kneecap. The surgeon then closes the wound with stitches or clips and puts a dressing on top. The artificial joint allows the knee to move more easily, which helps to reduce pain. So as the video explained, total knee replacement is an operation in which the damaged knee joint is replaced with an artificial joint and it's usually carried out in older people with knee arthritis. It's a very common operation, so typically there are 97,000 total knee replacements carried out each year in the UK. And patients waiting for a knee replacement often face a long wait whilst experiencing a lot of pain and having difficulty with normal everyday tasks. And there was a study published last year which found that almost one in four patients waiting for a knee replacement rated their overall health as worse than death. And this is particularly important because we know that if patients have worse symptoms before their knee replacement, they may not recover as well after the operation. We also know that even though most patients have a good recovery after their knee replacement, around one in five patients continue to experience long-term pain after the operation. And what this means is that preparing for a knee replacement is really important so that patients give themselves the best chances of recovery. And there are various types of support that can help patients to repair, prepare. So one is preoperative education, and this is referring to the information and guidance that patients get before their operation. This can help patient with, um, patients with things like practical preparations and also understanding what to expect before, during and after the operation. 
Another type of support that can be helpful is prehabilitation or prehab support. And this is basically referring to any activities that patients do before their operation to improve their health and well-being. So it can include things like exercise, weight management, stopping smoking and strategies to help with mental well-being. And what the diagram on this slide is showing is that if patients take part in prehab before their operation in what's known as a preoperative phase, then it can improve their health and well-being so that they're better able to withstand the stresses of the operation and recover faster afterwards. So this raises a question of what preoperative care do patients actually get when they're waiting for a knee replacement? And the answer is that it varies widely across the UK. So some patients don't receive any preoperative support. Others might receive a range of types of supports, and these can include knee schools, which are face-to-face -face group classes, telephone appointments, booklets, face-to-face one-to-one sessions, and digital tools like websites. And each of these different types of support have different advantages and disadvantages. So for example, with knee schools, it can provide a good opportunity to patient, for patients to chat to other patients. But a disadvantage is that some patients may not be able to attend due to things like work commitments and patients may forget some of the information before they, by the time they actually reach the operation. Another disadvantage of knee schools is that um, quite often um, they've had to be cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic and they haven't necessarily restarted um, since then. So digital tools have been suggested as a useful approach for overcoming some of the limitations um, of approaches like knee schools because they can deliver care remotely. And we know there's been a big push from the government to increase the use of digital tools in the NHS because they offer various advantages um, like being able to provide more personalised care and being able to provide care to large numbers of people at relatively low cost. But digital tools do also have disadvantages. So, for example, there's a real risk that they could increase unfair differences in health between different groups of people, because we know that the people who are most likely to need the most support may be the same people who are least likely to access digital tools. So before starting my PhD project, I explored these issues further through discussions with members of the NIHR Leeds Biomedical Research Centre Patient and Public Involvement Group. And these showed that patients were frustrated by the variations and limitations in care. They felt that the internet can be a useful resource, but they were concerned about websites being unreliable and not tailored to patients' individual needs. So they felt that a new digital tool developed with and for patients could be valuable. So this led on to developing my project and the aim of my project was to develop a new preoperative knee replacement digital tool called the Virtual Knee School to provide information and an exercise plan to patients waiting for a knee replacement. And we took patients feedback on board when um, planning the project. So for example, we decided to develop the digital tool as a website rather than a mobile app to make sure it was accessible to as wide a range of people as possible. So I just wanted to explain a little bit more about the patient and public involvement in my project because it was really important to make sure that patients' views stayed the driving force behind the projects and also to make sure that the website was usable, accessible and engaging for as wide a range of patients as possible. So as I've mentioned, I carried out uh, discussions with eight patient and public involvement representatives to help plan the project. And then I carried out a range of different patient and public involvement activities during my project. The main ones were that three PPI representatives were valued members of my project advisory group and eight patient models were filmed to create videos and photos for the virtual knee school. And just to explain a little bit more about the project advisory group, this was a group including patient and public involvement representatives and professionals and it met around every six months during my project. And the patient and public involvement representatives also took part in other activities in between the main meetings, such as helping to decide what to include in the virtual knee school. So Barbara has been involved as a valued member of my project advisory group right from the very beginning and she's kindly offered to share a bit about her motivation for getting involved in the project. So we're going to switch over and watch a recording from Barbara now. So I'll just bring that one up.
Um, the reason I wanted to be involved in our study is because going back 14 years ago, I'd had um, severe knee, knee problems leading to arthroscopy, which as I understand, it's keyhole surgery to clean out debris. Um, not a very exciting experience, but one that lingers in my mind as well, because I didn't have any information as to what to expect, what to prepare for, or actually any aftercare. And I think this is been a legacy that's really contributed to me prolonging going for knee surgery, which I should have had back three years ago, and I'm absolutely struggling now. So my motivation, as I say, is because I've had previous experience of um, not having very good recovery, and I would like patients to know what to expect when they go for a knee replacement, as I would like to know myself and also to empower patients to have the confidence to ask about what they need to know and what would be the best way to tackle aftercare and preoperative care. Great, so thanks Barbara for that. Ruby has also been um, a valued member of my project advisory group and one of the main reasons that Ruby got involved in the project is because she has a lot of experience and expertise in making research more inclusive and one of our um, priorities during the project was to make sure that it was as inclusive as possible. So Ruby would you be happy to maybe share a little bit about why making research inclusive is so important? For me making research inclusive is really important so that we have a wide range of people's needs and views and they're all taken into account so that the findings can benefit a wide range of people. That was really important for me. Great, thank you Ruby. And could you maybe give an example of the sort of things that we did to make sure we included a wide range of people and that our procedures were inclusive? So one example, um, we realised that everyone who had taken part in the first phases of the project were British white people. So we made sure we included people from minority ethnic groups in the final phase of the project. This was really important because the project benefits all backgrounds. We also included an accessibility tool on the website to allow users to change the language, text and background of the colour, which was really important as well. Great, thank you, Ruby. So next, I so just wanted to give a summary of my overall project so you can see how everything fits together. So the project was made up of a number of smaller studies and the studies shown in blue were all around sort of planning what to include in the website. And then these led into the final phase of my project, which is shown in green. And this involved developing a draft work version of the website and then improving it based on patient feedback. And I hope that, that is that this is going to lead on to future work where we can test the website to work out if it has any benefits. So the first phase of my project was reviewing past research on what preoperative knee replacement care should include and how the care should be delivered. So this involves screening over 3000 articles based on a brief summary of the article and then reviewing the full text reports of 185 articles. This led us to including 52 studies in the review. And we included two types of studies. One was a type of study looking at whether specific types of support have any benefits. And the other was a type of study looking at exploring patients and health professionals' views of specific types of support. And as you can see from the table on the side, we included stu studies covering a range of different types of support, the most common of which were education and exercise. So in terms of the key findings from our review, although we included 52 studies, a lot of these had significant limitations. So we found that evidence on what preoperative care should include and how it should be delivered was actually very patchy. One of our important findings was that using more than one delivery format, so for example, face-to-face -face group classes combined with a booklet or digital tool appeared to be helpful for most types of preoperative support. And this might be because employing more than one format can help with overcoming the limitations of the individual formats and account for patients' differing needs. And similarly, we found that personal tailoring appeared to be helpful for most types of preoperative support. 
Another important finding was that we found preoperative exercise plans may not need to include balance training or be delivered in hospital compared to at home. And our review fed directly onto the next part of the study. Um, and we're just going to share a recording now where Barbara and I discussed that in a little bit more detail. So we'll just go to that recording. So the next stage of our project was focused on developing recommendations on preoperative knee replacement care. We developed the recommendations for two purposes. One was to provide a resource to help health professionals decide what preoperative care to provide. And the other was to help us decide what to include in the virtual knee school. We used a type of study called a modified Delphi study. And this basically involves asking a group of experts called panel members to complete a series of questionnaires to gain agreement on a particular topic. And in our study, we had 60 panel members, including 30 patients and 30 professionals. We used three questionnaires and all of these included an initial list of recommendations on preoperative knee replacement care. So this included things like information topics, types of exercise and ways of delivering the information or exercise. We developed a draft of the initial recommendations based on the findings of our review. And to help make sure it was appropriate, we asked various people to test it. And this included our patient and public involvement representatives. And Barbara's kindly offered to share some of the feedback she provided on the draft um, set of recommendations. So firstly, Barbara, I know there were a few extra items that we hadn't included initially that you felt it would be helpful to include. Are you happy to provide an example of one of those, please? Yes, I thought that heat and cold applied to uh, your knee uh, was, was a useful uh, area to include because I know I derive a lot of comfort from having a hot water bottle um, priced between my knees when it, the pain's so bad or alternatively something cold, maybe a cold can of um, pop or even a, you walk in statement metal against your bare knee inside of the knee if that's where your pain emanates from. It seems to bring some comfort various times it would be alternatively one or the other or I'll try both at the same time when the pain's intense just to try and get a little bit of relief. Thank you Barbara, yeah so we hadn't included using heat and cold in the um, draft set of recommendations but then we added that in as an extra information topic. Um, so I know there were also a few items that you felt it'd be helpful to change, Barbara. Um, so for example, where we'd included um, an item in the initial recommendations, but you felt it needed to be made broader or clearer. Um, are you happy to provide an example of one of those, please? Yes, I thought just the general term osteoarthritis or osteo uh, problems was not really going to hit the button for me as regards knee problems because mine does emanate from rheumatoid arthritis that has caused a destruction which has led to osteoarthritis so connective tissue disorders lots of different reasons why people might need a knee replacement and I'd hate to think that people don't use this valuable resource to look at preoperative uh, care before uh, having a knee replacement if they think it only applies to osteo osteoarthritis um, di diagnosis. Yeah, I think that's, that was a really, really good point. Thank you, Barbara. So we'd initially included osteoarthritis as one of the information topics. Um, but as you say, although osteoarthritis is by far the most common reason for having a knee replacement, there are other conditions that can lead people's having a knee replacement. So we changed it from osteoarthritis to health conditions that may contribute to needing total knee replacement surgery. And then lastly, I know there are a couple of items where you felt it'd be helpful to explain the terms we we're using, because I know you had some concern that people completing the questionnaire might not know exactly what those terms mean. Are you happy to explain a, a bit more about that, please, Barbara? Yes, I just thought uh, the recommendations which spelt out health professionals in particular, I thought we really, or I personally, would like to know a little bit more detail about what they actually offer, such as the occupational therapy team and the social work team. Uh, 
and if there was some information in there as to what they actually do, their role and what they provide, I thought that was quite a, a useful thing to have, especially in the event that quite a few people do need knee replacements as they get older and are involved with the social work team or maybe even occupational therapy. So um, it's something that they can use as a resource to uh, explain the problems regarding the knee as regards appliances and various uh, changes, adaptions in the home. And so if you know more about what social work team do, then you're more apt to want to um, involve them with this website and actually uh, let them know that you're having a knee replacement and ask them for some advice as well. Great, thank you, Barbara. Yeah, so we'd initially just listed the different teams like the orthopaedic surgery team, the social work team, the occupational therapy team. But what we then did is we added some more info options. So you can probably just see on this slide, there's a little button that says more info. So we added some information there so that if um, people completing the questionnaire clicked the more info button, they were given an explanation about what that particular team could offer. So in all the questionnaires, we asked the panel members to rate how important they felt each item was, as shown in the example on the slide. In the first questionnaire, we also gave the panel members the opportunity to suggest new items. And then in the second and third questionnaire, we provided a summary of the panel members' responses to the previous questionnaire. And we used the findings of the third questionnaire to develop a finalised list of recommendations on preoperative knee replacement care. So our final recommendations were developed in two different versions. We developed a summary version that was primarily aimed at health professionals and a prioritised version, which was particularly helpful for us for informing the virtual knee school. And as the table shows, we included quite a large number of recommendation items, the largest proportion of which were education topics. We also included quite a large number of education exercise delivery approaches and quite a large number of exercise types. We included two other preoperative treatments, and these related to providing weight management, um, a weight management programme, and also to offering patients with anxiety or depression referral to cognitive behavioural based therapy, which is a type of talking therapy. So the next phase in the project was focused on finding out patients' views about what might encourage patients to use the virtual knee school or prevent them from using it. And to do this, I held group discussions with 14 patients who are either waiting for a knee replacement and or had previously had a total knee replacement. And these discussions provided patients with an opportunity to share their experiences of preparing for a knee replacement, how they felt a website might have helped and what they thought of possible features we could include in the website. And the quotes on this slide just show a couple of examples of the sort of things we were discussing. So the first quote in blue shows that um, one person had been given a booklet, but they felt it wasn't really long enough before their operation. And that was one reason why participants felt a website might be useful. The second quote in purple shows that some participants said they were put off from looking at web information um, on a website or the internet in general, because they were concerned about seeing photos or videos of real life surgery. So we recorded and reviewed the discussions to identify what we called themes. And these are basically patterns in what the participants said. So we identified two themes and these provided action points to address when developing the virtual knee school. So theme one states that the virtual knee school should account for individual differences. So these are differences in patients' needs and preferences. And we found that these individual differences could impact how patients engage with digital tools, preoperative information and preoperative health activities like exercise. So, for example, we found that different participants liked different types of exercise and also factors like having other health conditions and not being able to access certain equipment could affect um, what types of exercise patients could do. So we also thought about possible ways these could be addressed in the virtual knee school. So, for example, um, we felt it should provide a range of different types of exercise that patients could complete at home without requiring any specialist equipment. Theme two states that the virtual knee school should be tailored to the preoperative phase. And this is the time between when patients are put on the waiting list for the operation and the day they're admitted to hospital to actually have the operation. 
And we identified a range of different factors that are important in that preoperative phase. These include physical and mental factors like pain and patients' beliefs, social and work-related factors like being busy with other commitments, and limitations in preoperative care, such as not being given any advice about preoperative exercise. And again, we identified how the virtual needs school could address some of these factors. So, for example, participants felt that exercise email reminders might be helpful for people who forget to exercise due to being busy with other commitments. What we also did was to enter our findings into summary tables. And these included anything that might prevent patients from using the website, which we called barriers, anything that might encourage patients to use the website, which we called facilitators, and then design ideas about how we could address these barriers and facilitators. And we created separate summary tables for the different types of behavior that the virtual knee school was aiming to support. And this just provides an example from the exercise summary table. So an example of a barrier was that we found some patients may be afraid of exercising for a fear of damaging their knee further. So a way that this could be addressed in the virtual knee school is to provide reassurance that it's safe to exercise even if patients have bad knee arthritis. An example of a facilitator that could encourage patients to exercise is the ability to track when patients have completed their exercise, for example, through an online exercise diary. And what participants also suggested is that it would be helpful to have a principal exercise diary so that they could record their exercises without needing to keep going back to the website. And then the bottom row shows that we found some barriers and facilitators that were related to each other. So, for example, we found that setting goals and not meeting them might put people off exercising. And some participants said they just really disliked goal setting. However, the other participants said that setting goals, reviewing the goals and then receiving feedback on those goals could be really motivating and encourage them to exercise. So ways we could address this in the virtual knee school include providing an optional goal setting feature, printable goal setting sheets and guidance on setting realistic goals. So our final planning phase for the website involved using behaviour theories, which are basically ideas about what affects patients' behaviour. So our first approach was um, to create what are known as guiding principles and these basically summarise the key goals of the website and how they can be addressed. So for example one of our goals was to make sure that we addressed um, any patients possible concerns about um, the information on the website. So for example uh, we made it clear that the website didn't include any photos or videos of real life surgery. Our second approach was what's called a behaviour analysis and this is where we used existing theory to help create a detailed list of possible website features and the benefits of this is that it helps us make sure we weren't missing any really important features for the website and it also allowed us to describe those features using standardised terms. And then our third approach was to develop what's known as a logic model and this is basically a diagram showing how we think the website will work. So it included things like the problems the website's going to address, the changes we're expecting to happen if patients are using the website, and possible benefits that patients might get if they use the website. So after we'd completed all our website planning phases, the next stage was to actually develop a draft version of the virtual knee school. And we developed that based on the findings of the earlier phases, um, patient and public involvement discussions, and also relevant guidelines. And this slide just summarises how we decided to structure the website. So you can see we included a login and a sign up process shown in pink, a main homepage shown in dark blue, and then three main sections which are shown in purple. The first main section was called About the Virtual Knee School, and this was a brief introductory section. But although it was brief, it was really important because it addressed some of those key barriers and facilitators we identified in the earlier phases. For example, we included a video that explained that the website doesn't include any photos or videos of real life surgery. The second main section was information for your surgery and we split this into three smaller subsections. These covered what to expect, preparing for surgery and recovering from surgery. And then the final main section was called your exercise plan and this provides an exercise program for patients to do while they're waiting for their operation and it also includes features that help patients to engage with that exercise program such as a goal setting feature. 
So when it came to actually creating the virtual knee school, we used a multi-step process and our patient and public involvement representatives were involved in each step. The first step was around designing the website, so deciding on things like the colour scheme and logo. And once we decided on some of those key points, we started working with a web development company called Frank. And Frank created some PDF documents that showed what the website could look like. And we had the opportunity to provide feedback on those documents. Um, so Ruby, I know you provided some really helpful feedback at the website design stage. Are you happy to maybe provide an example um, of some of that feedback, please? Yes, I was concerned that people may miss the accessibility tool because it was situated at the bottom of the web pages. So the team agreed to add text to the first page. Uh, so users can see when the login gives an explanation of where the accessibility tool is and how to use it. Yeah, great. Thank you. So I think that was a really useful addition so that patients actually knew, knew that accessibility toolbar was there. So the next stage was around building the draft website. So um, it was Frank, the web development company, who started to build the draft website. And then we held a couple of um, what we called dis sort of discussion sessions to view that draft website um, and have an opportunity for feedback. So again, Ruby, could you maybe provide an example of some feedback you provided at, at that stage? Well, the initial plan was to include goal setting feature, a goal setting feature that asked users to set weekly exercise goals and only allow users to review the goals after a week. But I felt it would be useful for the goal setting feature to be as flexible as possible. So together we actually agreed to make it possible for users to review their goals at any time and we adopted the wording so that users were asked whether they carried out their goals as planned rather than referring specifically to last week. Yeah, great. So that was a really helpful way we could make the, the website more flexible to adapt to patients' differing needs. And then the last phase was where we had an opportunity to actually test the draft website ourselves. Um, and again, Ruby, I know you highlighted lots of really, really valuable points there. Please, could you maybe give us an example of one of those? Well, I found initially the videos on the website did not show the captions or subtitles automatically. So I suggested changing the settings so that the caption subtitles, this showed automatically and also include the instructions to explain how to change the video settings. Um, the instructions were added in a box above the videos so that users can click on that display. Um, so it showed you how, the, how to follow through to switch on the captions. Great, thank you, Ruby. Um, so what we thought we'd do next is watch one of the um, exercise videos because we're aware we've probably all been sat down still for quite a while. So you're very welcome to join in with this exercise video if you'd like to. Um, but obviously, if you have been advised not to exercise by a health professional or you have any other concerns, we'd ask that you please don't try the exercise. Um, so we'll just switch over to that video now. Knee straightening. To get ready for this exercise, sit on a steady upright chair which does not have wheels. Make sure your bottom is near the back of the chair seat. Do not lean on the chair back. Rest your hands on the arms or sides of the chair. Put your feet flat on the floor with your knees bent at right angles. To carry out the exercise, straighten one knee and lift your foot up off the floor. Use your thigh muscles to keep your knee as straight as possible for at least three seconds. Then slowly lower your foot to the floor. Aim to carry out the exercise for at least 15 seconds with each leg. Then have a 30 second rest. Repeat the exercise three times in total. To make the exercise harder, hold your knee straight for longer or carry out the exercise for longer.
So after we developed the draft website, I carried out what are known as think aloud interviews with nine patients who are waiting for or who previously had a knee replacement. And think aloud interviews basically involve participants working through the website and saying out loud their thoughts as they do so. And we also gave the participants an opportunity to share their overall views of the website at the end. And the quotes on this slide just provide a few examples of the type of feedback we um, the participants provided. And what we found was that most participants really liked the websites because they felt it provided information that was realistic, reassuring um, and relevant to them. We found participants felt the website was generally clear and easy to use and they also liked the exercise programme and particularly the range of different exercises provided. However, we also found that there were a small number of participants who felt the website didn't fully meet their needs. For one participant, this was because he felt the information was irrelevant because it wasn't um, new information to him. He knew it all already. Um, and also he felt the exercises were too easy for him compared to the ones he was used to doing. We also found that two participants felt the digital format didn't fully meet their needs. This was for reasons like finding it anxiety provoking and hard to use. And related to this, one thing that we found quite a few participants felt was quite challenging was using the sign up and login process for reasons like finding it difficult to actually type an email address. And a few participants also had broader concerns about needing to sign up to the website, such as a fear that they'd be sent lots of messages. So we use the feedback from those interviews to gradually improve the website and we made changes on an ongoing basis. The changes were to a wide range of areas. And these included, for example, the design. So we'd included some boxes that participants could select to display extra information, but we found that not everybody realised it was possible to select those boxes. So we addressed this by adding some text to explain that users could select the boxes. And we also changed their colour from purple to blue to make them different to the other um, buttons on the website. We also made some changes to the structure. Um, and the, the biggest change was uh, to the information section. So as I've mentioned, we initially included one information section with three smaller subsections. And what we found was that when participants selected the drop down menu, which is shown in dark blue at the top there, and they could see all the different information pages at once, which is 24 pages, it felt a bit overwhelming. So what we did was we changed each of the information subsections into a main section by itself and this limited the maximum number of pa pages that patients saw at once to eight which was a lot more manageable. And then we also made some changes to the content. So for example we'd initially advised users to carry out five exercises in each session but due to some concern that that might be too many for some people we adapted the text to say that any number of exercises will have benefits and patients can build up to five exercises if they need to. So what we thought we'd do next is um, give you a brief tour of the virtual knee school because at the moment it is only accessible through a, um, a regulated sign-in process. So we'll just go to the virtual knee school now. So hopefully you can see that. Uh, this is the home screen. You can see you've got a little introduction to the website here and we've got the help and log out buttons at the top. We've got a few different ways of navigating around the website. So one option is to type text into the search box here, and then that will bring up a list of pages that are, um, are relevant to whatever you typed into the search box. Another option is to use a drop down menu. So that's by hovering over these uh, titles at the top, and then you can see all the pages in a particular section. And then a third option is to use the buttons on the pages. So if we go down, this is the home page. So it shows buttons to each of the main sections. So for example, if we select preparing, that will take us to the preparing for your operation section. And then if we go down, we can see all the different pages that are in that section. So if we select one of those buttons, that will take us to that individual page. And you can see here, we've got a little bit of text We've then got um, some of these boxes that I mentioned that you, you can select to view extra text. And on this page, we've also got some videos. You can see we've got uh, the information here that Ruby mentioned about how to play the video and change the settings. We've also got the option to download text from the videos. 
And at the bottom of each page, we've got back buttons and next buttons that you can select. So if I just provide an example of how to use that drop down menu. So if you hover over one of those um, titles at the top, that brings up the options in that section. So if we go to say carry out an exercise session, that will take you straight to that page. And here again, we've got some text. This is explaining how to use the exercise programme. And then for each category of exercise, we've got different um, exercises. So patients can pick whichever exercise they feel suits them. And from all the pages, we can go back to the home page. And lastly, just to show you the accessibility tool that we've mentioned. So it's possible to make the text bigger or smaller. It's also possible to change the contrast. And it's possible to change the language of the website. So we'll just go back to the presentation now. So after we'd finished all the different phases of the project, I combined the findings of the phases to develop two overall conclusions. And these both provide recommendations that could be applied to research and clinical practice. The first conclusion is that patients should have access to a wide range of preoperative care in digital and non-digital formats. And this is because we found that patients generally value wide ranging preoperative care as long as it's in a format that meets their needs. We know that digital formats have specific benefits. For example, they can provide detailed information quickly and they can include things like videos, but also that, digi not, that digital formats don't meet everyone's needs. So it's important we also provide non-digital alternatives. The second conclusion states that preoperative digital tools should offer automatic tailoring and allow patients to tailor the tools themselves. And this was because we found that tailoring tools to patients' individual needs and preferences is really important. And there's two main ways we can achieve that tailoring. One is automatic tailoring where patients enter details into the website and then its content is adapted based on whatever details they entered. And an example of this in the virtual knee school was the goal setting feature. And this is what allowed patients to set goals, review their goals and then receive personalised feedback, which some participants felt would be really helpful. And another tailoring option is to allow patients to tailor the tool themselves, for example, by offering a choice of different exercises. And this is helpful because it gives patients more control and ownership over what they're doing. And also it, it can allow a way of tailoring the tool without relying on patients logging in, which is important because, as I mentioned, we found that needing to sign up and log into the website could be a barrier for some people. So in terms of thinking about our next steps, we've got another recording, so I'm just going to share that now. So we're still in the process of working out what our next steps are going to be after this project. And we've identified a few priorities to help us decide what to do. And one of these is to make sure that our next steps are driven by what patients want. So Barbara is going to share what she thinks is important for our next steps. Um, I think putting it into practice and that is to say, let it go live in its um, full capacity as a resource for, for patients. Uh, certainly empowering them to be able to ask healthcare professionals uh, more poignant questions about the preoperative care and post care. Uh, and if there's a website there that they can educate themselves with, this gives you the confidence to want to ask professionals questions. So yes, if we can see it go live, that'd be fantastic, I think. Um, and I do think also that uh, uh, raising awareness, especially with health professionals, is a, is a must so that they in turn can help you, that they need to be aware that this resource exists. Uh, back to my point where I was explaining that it's nice to have um, them involve the social workers, occupational therapies and so on teams. And if they're aware of the site, then they understand what they're actually being asked because they can view what the site tells you what it's offering as regards patients and professionals to pre-operative and post-care. Great, thank you Barbara. 
yeah, so some some really good priorities picked up there. And one of the um, of our priorities that we felt really important is that we promote equality and inclusion in any work we do. And this is to make sure that our work benefits as wide a range of people as possible, and also to make sure that we address any factors that can contribute to unfair differences in health between different groups of people. And a key consideration for the virtual knee school is that not everybody can access digital tools. So Barbara is going to explain one of her suggestions about how to address this. I tend to be a little bit old school and I like something to touch and feel regards uh, a little booklet with the information in about the knee school content, virtual knee school content. I think uh, not everybody's internet, internet savvy and also um, when you have other arthritic problems, your fingers don't necessarily work as well. So I think it's nice if you've got something that you can either leave on the bookshelf or put in your handbag or in your pocket, but it's just nice as a quick reference if there's an alternative to it being actually online. Great, thank you, Barbara. So as Barbara's explained, having a booklet could be really helpful for some people. Um, but as I mentioned, we also know that digital tools have specific advantages over booklets, such as being able to include videos. So it's important to support people to use digital tools if they'd like to. And Ruby has some really helpful insights into this area. So Ruby, please could you maybe provide an example of how we can support people to use digital tools and maybe address some of those barriers that people may face? One of the options for people who don't have much or any experience of using digital tools is to provide a digital uh, to provide digital mentoring, uh, which can be in the mentee's own language. Another barrier some people may face is that they may not have access to digital tools and data, but there are organisations that can help with that. For example, providing loans. Um, providing or loaning digital devices and providing free data. There are digital support organisations uh, which are highlighted on the um, slide. Um, so organisations such as 100% Digital Leads and Good Thing Foundation do support people. Great, that's really helpful. Thanks, Ruby. So, as we've mentioned, we're not 100% sure what our next steps will be, so this slide just highlights what are some possible evaluation options to consider. One would be to do a service evaluation where we make the virtual knee school available locally to find out if patients use it and whether they think it's helpful. And this could be a, a good way to get some quick feedback on whether the virtual knee school might be useful, but it wouldn't provide us with good quality evidence on whether it has any benefits. So another option would be to do a randomised controlled trial. This would be where we'd allocate patients by chance to one of two groups, one group that received the virtual knee school and one that received usual care. And then we'd compare those two groups to see if the virtual knee school has any benefits. And this would provide us with good quality evidence, but it would take many, many years. And another disadvantage of randomised controlled trials is that they focus on working out if something is helpful rather than how it works. So a third option would be to do a, something called a realist evaluation. This would involve exploring how a range of people use or don't use the virtual knee school to find out what works, for whom, in what settings and why. This is quite a complex design, so again, it would take quite a long time, but um, probably not as long as a randomised controlled trial. And the other main benefit is that it would provide information that's really meaningful, particularly if we're wanting to think about things like whether the virtual knee school has any impact on unfair differences in health between different groups of people. So just to summarise the take home messages from our presentation. We know that preoperative knee replacement care varies across the UK and it doesn't meet all patients' needs. To help address this, we've developed a new preoperative digital tool called the Virtual Knee School. Patient and public involvement was central throughout our project to make sure that our research and the Virtual Knee School meets patients' needs. One of our key findings was that the Virtual Knee School is likely to be helpful for at least some patients, but more research is needed to confirm that. We also found it's important to offer patients preoperative care in digital and non-digital formats and to tailor digital tools to patients' individual needs and preferences. 
So lastly, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who's um, helped and supported my project in any way. There's far too many people to mention, but just a special thank you to my supervisors because their input has been so key at absolutely every stage. Um, and also a big thanks again to my project advisory group members, especially Barbara and Ruby for presenting today. And these are some references, um, including publications from the project and the references included in the presentation. And we've now got an opportunity for questions.